Okay, so hi, I'm Michelle Wild, and um, my background, I have a degree in psychology, and I am a teacher at Coastline Community College, which is in Southern California. I teach adults with acquired brain injury. I do cognitive rehabilitation skills within an educational environment. And uh, I'm also the founder of a nonprofit, Brain Education Strategies and Technology. Lori? All right, uh, my name's Lori Powell. I'm a research um, professor at uh, University of Oregon with the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training, same um, place as Melissa. And um, I, along with Michelle, have conducted applied research and uh, focused on assistive technology for cognition, supporting uh, adults who have uh, acquired brain injury, who have cognitive issues, and, and that could benefit from using um, smartphones and well-selected apps to, to help compensate for those cognitive challenges. So that's what brings us together. Uh, we've worked on a couple of federally funded projects together, had a whole lot of fun, learned a lot, and we're just delighted to be here today to share um, this work that we've done together. Absolutely. Okay, so let's move on to the, the next slide. So here's a couple of disclosures, which we just sort of uh, went over. Um, in terms of our presentation topics, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the common challenges that are associated with problem solving for people with brain injuries. And uh, a lot of these challenges come from research. Uh, a lot of them also come directly from the students that I work with on a daily basis at Coastline. And so um, these are, are straight from the individuals with brain injuries that are dealing with these kinds of issues on a regular basis. We also would like to suggest some tools and some strategies that can possibly help with some of the problem solving issues that individuals have. And then we're also going to do a brief overview of ProSolve and also of an app called uh, Reach My Goals. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the research that's been associated with those apps. So to get started, I'm going to do a few slides just kind of as an introduction. And then Lori's going to talk um, for a little bit, and then I'll kind of uh, follow up at the end. So we start with some of the cognitive issues that impact individuals with brain injuries, both in a school, home, and also a working environment. Um, and some of those you should recognize. Low energy is uh, a potential factor for individuals with brain injury. Poor insight, um, not knowing necessarily that there is a problem, not recognizing that the problem relates to them, um, and also potentially not um, being able to come up with possible solutions. Uh, attention is another cognitive issue that can potentially get in the way. Um, not paying attention to the details, not recognizing certain kinds of things. All of these issues can impact a person's ability to effectively problem solve in both a home, school, and, and work environment. Uh, also, slow processing speed. So if a person needs to make a decision um, or solve a problem and their processing speed is delayed, that can definitely cause issues uh, in their overall problem solving um, process. It can also cause issues for them in a variety of other ways uh, in terms of um, the amount of, obviously, the amount of time it takes them to problem to solve the problem. Um, to recognize the problem. Uh, also, the slow processing speed can be a factor when they're dealing with other individuals. So one of the things that I often hear from my students is not only that they are frustrated by their slow processing speed, but others around them, their family or their coworkers, can also be impacted by the slow processing speed in the problem solving process. Uh, memory is also a major factor in this. Uh, if an individual is having memory issues, then uh, number one, remembering what the problem is. Uh, and that's one of the things that Lori will talk about in terms of ProSolve with regards to actually writing things down, keeping sort of a journal or a log, if you will, of, of the types of problems. Um, also, memory for what kinds of solutions might be available, what kinds of solutions they might have used in the past that worked or didn't work. Um, one of the issues that we want to try and prevent people from having is continuing to use the same 
uh, ineffective strategy or the same ineffective uh, solution to a problem over and over again. So memory becomes a major factor. Uh, it's really hard to uh, separate goal setting from a lot of the different um, issues associated with both decision making and problem solving. And so goal setting is a potential issue. Organization also, one of the things that can be very helpful is to have individuals categorize uh, perhaps their goals so that it's easier for them to find information that they might have in a journal or in something like the, the ProSolve manual. Uh, time management is also a major factor in this area. So if an individual uh, is dealing with time management issues, uh, we see people who really just can't make, uh, can't solve problems, can't make decisions. Um, they get sort of uh, what they call paralyzed with uh, indecision and with the problem to the point where they really can't move forward. And so that potentially causes all sorts of other problems um, in and of itself. And then, you know, problem solving in general, obviously, is an issue, and that's one of the, the primary issues that we're going to focus on here. However, all these other cognitive issues can impact directly on problem solving, but they're also issues that can affect uh, individuals just on a day-to-day -day basis with um, whether the, the issues are minor issues or more significant. Problem solving is really a higher order or a metacognitive activity that arises in situations for which no response is immediately apparent or available. And this is quite challenging for individuals with brain injury, uh, because if they don't see uh, a response, again, with memory and some of the other cognitive issues that, that I mentioned previously, uh, for an individual without a brain injury, problem solving, uh, they may have the memory to recall, sort of, this has happened to me before, and this is how I've resolved that. Uh, when we work with individuals with brain injuries, sometimes that memory isn't there or that attention isn't there. And so problem solving as defined here can be especially um, relevant and difficult for individuals with brain injuries. Um, common issues specifically with problem solving, as I mentioned earlier, just recognizing that a problem exists. Uh, it, it's quite common actually for an individual to not really recognize that there's a problem. Uh, I'm gonna pull back time management for just a minute. Uh, in some of the students that I work with, one of, the, one of the primary issues might be time management. The person is late for appointments uh, or late for school on a regular basis, and they don't necessarily recognize that as a problem. Uh, and the consequence to that in our environment, in the school environment, may be getting no credit for a class, but in a working environment, uh, not recognizing a problem such as time management could mean uh, you know, the potential of losing a job. So that recognition of the problem existing is really key. And then really identifying and describing what the problem is. Uh, one of the key things here as we were working on the ProSolve project was that idea that oftentimes we think a problem is a problem and yet that's not really the problem that we have. So um, sometimes the, the actual problem is hidden a little bit deeper and it's not until you stop and you sort of think about it and you go through a similar process to what we're gonna describe that in fact you really identify the true problem. And what's interesting about that is once the true problem has been identified, then you kind of have to go back and go through that entire problem solving process again. So it can seem like a very overwhelming thing, uh, but if you haven't identified the correct problem, then basically you may be solving something that really isn't a problem or solving a different problem and the one that you thought was the issue actually never does get resolved. So there's a lot of potential issues with that. Um, also recognizing prior knowledge and experience. This is one of the things that I was talking about potentially with memory, um, with attention, uh, really recognizing sort of the, the question, what do I already know about this? So um, it may be an issue such as an individual calling technical support because they're having a problem with their computer. If they stop and they ask themselves, what do I already know about this? What do I know about calling technical support? What do I know 
um, has been the issue before when my screen goes blue or something to that effect, that can actually help sort of orient people to honing in on exactly what that problem is. It can also, in a technical support call, it can also benefit them greatly because essentially they're prepared for the kinds of questions that a technical support person might actually be asking them. Um, if they're not prepared, then that actually causes another problem and then you sort of get a snowball effect because now they have the problem of not knowing, let's say, what the serial number is on their device and they can't get technical support without that information. Um, identifying appropriate solutions. What are the possible solutions? How effective might those solutions be or how, might, how effective might they have been in the past? Uh, should all be considered in that problem solving um, experience. And then basically realistically evaluating the solution results. Uh, and this is really critical. Oftentimes people don't evaluate the results of a decision or the results of a problem, a solution to a problem that they might have experienced. Uh, so that's one issue, but realistically evaluating that is a whole different thing. Oftentimes um, people aren't realistic in how they evaluate the effectiveness of a potential solution. And as a result of that, they may continue to try to use that solution over and over again with the same result that may not be an adequate result for that particular situation. Um, here's a few problem solving issues described by survivors. So processing information. Uh, we talked about processing speed. Uh, this is something that individuals that we've talked to have identified. The ability to actually reason, uh, reason through a problem. Memory, I mentioned that earlier and talked a little bit about that. Being unaware that there even is a problem to begin with. Um, knowing that there's a problem, but not really knowing what the problem is or not knowing what to do about it. So these, again, are issues that have been described specifically by brain injury survivors. Defining the problem, that first step, without defining the problem clearly, the rest of the process um, can get uh, distorted. And so we want to make sure that we help individuals define the problem clearly to begin with, if at all possible. And then lastly, motivation. Uh, sometimes people aren't motivated because they see it as a problem and they're not motivated to do anything about it. It could be motivation, uh, lack of motivation, because they have had problems before, they have not had adequate solutions. Uh, they have been realistic, perhaps, in the solutions that they've chosen, and as a result of that, their motivation decreases and that can be problematic. Let's see. Um, and then I believe this is where Lori is going to pick up with some of the common problem solving steps. Okay, great. Um, so this you're going to screen right now. Yeah. Okay, and then I should bring up the full screen of the PowerPoints on my computer. Is that right? If you have them on your computer, yeah, and then accept share chain or share the screen okay. presenter. Okay, so I click on share. Yep. Correct. All right. And then. Let me. Um, and there you are. Make it big. All right. And I will do that. So How's that? Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you, Michelle, for that nice overview of of the um, the complexity that surrounds problem solving in everyday life. Um, uh, particularly after traumatic brain injury. Um, it's not called a higher order thinking skill for nothing because like Michelle said, so many cognitive systems feed into the ability to think on your feet and solve a problem. Uh, and I checked with uh, Amanda uh, earlier today to get a little bit of a feel for the background of those of you who are uh, participating in today's webinar. And it's my understanding that um, several of you are educators working in the school system uh, with youth. And so I think it's, um, while what we have to share with you all today is, is very important information in general, I think it's good for us to have in the back of mind, it's like, well, let's think about this from the perspective of a child with the brain injury, what this interface between higher order thinking skills, problem solving in particular, and what it's like for uh, a student, a youth uh, who uh, is sustained a brain injury, and they're struggling with problem solving, uh, both maybe academically, uh, dealing with 
you know, a myriad of kinds of issues that come up dealing with social problem solving. I mean, I'm sure you could all list dozens of <laughs> situations in which uh, students with TBI are, struggle with thinking through issues and coming up with different solutions and so forth. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, that um, what we have to share with you here today hopefully has relevance to the younger population and, um, and also to really underscore uh, the obvious difference with the youth in that they don't have the life experience that adults have. Uh, who, when an adult sustains an acquired brain injury, whether they're 20, 25, 30, 35, and so forth, they, they have all that life experience uh, that predates the injury. And uh, as we know, oftentimes memory systems, long-term memory systems are relatively preserved uh, following brain injury. So you can kind of think, like Michelle said, well, what do I know about this issue? Uh, you know, what experience can I draw upon, whether it's before my injury or now that I've had this injury and now I know what life is like and I, I struggle with this. But it's a, diff it's a different ballgame for kids. But it doesn't mean that what, you know, uh, what we're pitching here is um, research supported, explicit training around problem solving, that it doesn't have relevance for kids. It's just, um, it's keeping that piece of life experience back of mind and that and, and the, the fact that the injury is happening on the developing brain with the executive function system still coming online um, through adolescence and beyond. So with that caveat, let's take a look at these five very common steps to problem solving. Um, step one, uh, well, there's the pre-step <laughs> to step one, which is, is there a problem? Uh, and Michelle alluded to that earlier. And then, well, what is it? Step two, possible solutions, pros and cons of each of those solutions. Step three, which solution would work best in a situation? What's my plan for implementing the solution? And, uh, and step five, that very important uh, re reflection. How did it go? What am I going to do the next time that's the same or different? So um, as I mentioned earlier, there's pretty strong research that supports a very explicit systematic approach to training problem solving skills following brain injury. And what we're presenting here today are two basic options to do that. Uh, one is a paper and pencil support system, and the other is looking at assistive technology. So let's start with the paper and pencil system. So what we have here is called a Think Through the Problem Worksheet. And this worksheet uh, is from the ProSolve manual that Amanda sent to all of you um, uh, that comes out of the uh, what we call the GPS TBI grant that Michelle and I worked on together. GPS, in this case, for generalizing problem solving strategies following TBI to everyday environments. We shortened that to pro solve, becoming a, a pro at solving problems and problem solving, get the play on words there. Uh, so in the manual, you have this sheet. And, um, and as, this, we, as we worked on the manual and worked on the app that's, that we'll talk about here in just a bit, uh, it was very clear that before you even start pounding on the technology, you need to just sit for a moment and, and think, OK, what is going on here? That's, that's bothering me. And this worksheet is meant to be um, used with another person. A coach uh, is, is what we like to say. It could be anyone, you know, uh, a clinician, uh, 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 educational assistant. Um, it could be anybody who could help the individual struggling with a particular problem to think it through. Uh, so it's, it takes the burden off of having to have it to do it all on your own. Um, so you'll see the parallel uh, in the, these worksheets to the steps I just went through, those five steps. So what is the problem? And then a nice, short, clear description. What do I already know about the problem? And what else do I need to know? And there's a host of questions here. You don't have to go through all of them. But one I'd like to kind of home in on here is number two. Uh, and this is, is this a big deal or a little deal problem for me? And if any of you have ever heard Tim Feeney uh, speak, he homes in on this sort of thing, which is, you know, sometimes what we think is a big problem really isn't and vice versa. And that gets to the awareness piece that Michelle was talking about earlier. Also, where does it occur? When does it occur? Who else is involved? And if uh, those of you are familiar with functional behavior uh, assessments, there's elements of that here in the sheet. And basically what this is an attempt to do is to help the individual do a sort of a self 
um, assessment or, uh, using functional behavior analysis skills. Okay, so let's move on to the next sheet, which is kind of distilling out what we learned from the first think it through, think through the problem worksheet, and then putting it into nice, you know, kind of little boxes here just to boil it down. So, again, what is the problem? Describe it in your own words. Try to use just one sentence or a couple phrases. Again, what do I already know about the problem? That's a, a distillation of the triggers and the whens and the wheres and so forth that we just talked about. The solutions, pros and cons, and which solution will I try? Excuse me, I went too fast there. And the, the, on this slide, the, the worksheet is cut off, but this is in your ProSolve manual that you can keep and print off the worksheets and use them to your heart's content. So that, those are a couple of examples of pencil paper uh tools that you can use and then with the project the gps tbi project we extended this work into trying to have a, a web create a web-based app that would follow the step to problem solving so could, a person could have it on their smartphone and use the tool to help them think through problems and have a resource library if you would uh, of problems and solutions that are unique to them so here's a screenshot of the landing page to the ProSolve app. Um, and I'm just going to tell you right now that the ProSolve app is not available, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So this is what we used in uh, our development project, and we uh, put this through a, a small group study. So here's the landing page. Right we started, and you have problem solution effects, and those were all hyperlinked to pages that um, you could add or modify problems, solutions, and, and then be able to go wrap and, and rate the effectiveness of solutions. So that's that very important reflection piece that Michelle was talking about. So that's the landing page. And then here in the app itself, we basically replicated the problem solution effect worksheet that you saw earlier, but this, in this case, it's in the app, right? So let's just quickly go through what you see here, which is in this case, we used fatigue as the key problem as our example, because it is very common. So what is the problem? I'm always fatigued, keeps me from getting anything done. What do I already know about it? Well, it's usually it's more in the afternoon, but um, and it doesn't seem to be affected by anything that I'm doing during the day. And so here's that sort of, this is what I know, this is when it happens and so forth. What are possible solutions? So chosen take a short nap or take a mindful moment. This is from the stock of solutions that have been created for the person to use. Um, and then there's you can add a solution from your master list. You can create a new solution for the problem. And then um, down below you see what is my plan for trying out the solution and afterwards how did it go? So it really tries to reflect those five steps to problem solving that we described earlier. And here's just a quick look at the reflection page with the stars and so forth. It's a little bit larger to make it easier to, to, um, to see. And you'll see down below the message button, for example, and that uh, the, the app had um, a, 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 um, an email client attached to it or a, a way to send emails from the app to a coach so that the uh, individual with a brain injury and the coach could process what was going on together. So it was a way to close the loop in terms of getting feedback and support around problem solving. Here's the solutions page for, uh, um, you know, this sort of library of solutions, not particular to, to fatigue. It's just the kind of you can go kind of scroll through and see the different kinds of strategies that have been helpful for a variety of problems, really. Okay, so that's a, just a sweep through the ProSolve worksheets and the ProSolve app. So we, as I mentioned, we did a couple of research studies uh, with the ProSolve package. Uh, and I'll focus primarily on our single case study. It was with one individual, her, um, her pseudonym is Alyssa. And we wanted this to be a very person-centered, you're in charge here, what's important to you, and let's make the app and the program work for you. And so in her case, she wanted to make better, better decisions when confronted with a problem. So she was generally interested in problem solving and planning. She saw it. she was very aware of these challenges in her life. Um, she was a, a college student um, trying to take some classes at a local community college and um, was really trying to kind of juggle lots of things, homework and trying to work out and have a family life and so forth. Her challenges were struggling to see the whole picture, jumping to immediately to solutions, and then this 
increased stress that was attached to uh, having, you know, this myriad of, of issues of not being able to think ahead and, and so forth. And I want to stress here that in the research around problem solving, a huge factor is um, the emotional component to problem solving. Um, if you think, you maybe do some self-reflection for a moment, you can imagine that certain problems uh, one might be able to solve like, you know, very easily, I feel confident that I can do it. And yet in another context or even on a, in a different on a different day for feeling fatigue, the same problem might just feel so difficult and hard to tackle. And then there's sort of a cycle that can kick in, which is I'm feeling really bad. I can't figure my figure out what's going on. So it's really important to think about the emotional components of problem solving as well. In Alyssa's um, program, she uh, basically used the app. She was very good at using technology. She used it a little bit outside of her coaching sections, but she intended to prefer the hard copy worksheets um, because uh, she and her husband um, together worked on the problems together and she found that it was just easier to do joint referencing with the, crop, the hard copy worksheets than it was with the, the problem solving app. And then um, so the app itself wasn't that successful or that useful in this case, but the basic steps to problem solving were as, as um, manifest in these worksheets. Um, and she did very well. Uh, a lot of her outcome measures, which were looking at executive functions, memory, and also just her own personal goals. And she reported that ProSolve as a package made a significant difference in her life. And then in her group study, uh, we had 23 individuals. Four, it was a randomized control trial, very small randomized control trial with 14 people randomized to pro-solve condition and nine randomized to usual care. Usual care for problem solving here was SMART goal training, um, uh, other types of metacognitive strategy training. There were three sites, uh, rehabilitation programs involved, five coaches. Uh, basically, there were no significant differences between the groups in terms of which did, did was ProSolve better or not from usual care for problem solving. And, and there are probably a lot of reasons why that was the case that we didn't see major differences. But everyone that was in the ProSolve condition did say, hey, we, we like the program as a whole and would recommend it. Um, so this study taught us a lot. We knew we, we, if we could have had more participants, that would have been great. We definitely recognized the need for a simpler app design and um, more time might have been helpful. Sometimes these skills take a while to really take hold. Uh, so we had limited the coaching sessions to just six sessions. So that's not a lot, but we did that because in, in the real world, sometimes that's all you get in uh, adult rehab in this case. So we wanted to see if we could make it work within the, the real world time constraints of, of um, what's available to people now. Um, and the role of technology versus the coach. Um, many, many of the participants in the ProSolve condition said the coach was really the key part, that sense of having an ally helping think through and support the individual felt good and, and was very important. So it's not that the technology didn't have a role, uh, but it's like this combination of having a person and having the technology would be the ideal. Um, and also what we didn't get to do is really look at problem solving in the moment versus specific problem solutions entered into the app, which would prevent a problem or circumvent one from happening. Okay, so Michelle, um, I think it's your time to go ahead and take over. It should be showing up, Michelle. There we go. Michelle, we can't hear you. There we go. Is that better? Yep. If you could start. My, my dogs did start barking, and so I muted myself. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so basically what we're doing, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about an app that I actually created um, called Reach My Goals. And 
reach my goals uh, it follows a lot of the sort of the principles that we've talked about in terms of um, some of the cognitive issues that people have to deal with and some of the things that came out of of the ProSolve research um, this obviously is for goal setting uh, so it's a little bit different although um, interestingly enough the students that I teach at the community college use reach my goals on an everyday basis and i'll give you a little bit more background about that uh, but this is just a few quick slides and so uh, this app was sort of um, i took some of the information um, that we had learned as we were sort of working through um, the the, um, the goal setting app, i'm sorry the the problem solving app and uh, applied it to goal setting. This is something that I was actually doing. Um, and so what we did here was we started off with the idea of a template. So um, one of the things that can actually be very helpful is to provide templates to begin with. So um, in this particular case, we provide a template, as you can see here, uh, which is some generic text about, in this case, writing an English essay. Um, and we also provided some template tasks. And so one of the problems that we identified that people have is number one, identifying the problem. In this case, actually identifying the goal. And then after that, actually looking at the potential steps that might need to be um, integrated in order to solve the problem, or again, in this case, um, reach the goal that the individual sets. So you can see here again, it's an English essay, and we've provided a list of tasks that would be typically expected of a person who is going to be working on an English essay. Now, once the person chooses the template, they're actually able to go in and edit this. So if it was a, a psychology paper or something like that, then they would be able to, to modify the actual goal description itself. Uh, they could also go in and actually modify the steps to make it more relevant for that particular individual. This is designed specifically to give them sort of a, a quick start, if you will, on um, what they may need to do. So this is actually quite good. Uh, the templates that we have here are quite good for individuals who might be students, sorry, um, for individuals who might be students and uh, needing to work on papers, etc. Um, we also provide a, what we call a summary screen. And so uh, we look at what the SMART goal is that the individuals identified. Again, with the idea, um, one of the things that we, you know, that we do is we look at this from not so much a coaching perspective as uh, Lori was talking about, but because I'm, an, I'm the instructor, I'm in the classroom with them, we actually do this uh, as a small group. And so as the students in my class begin to set their goals, we actually spend time in a small group kind of an environment, helping them clarify what that goal is and what the steps might need to be, et cetera. So uh, we're sort of built in coaches in the classroom. And what ends up happening as, is as individuals begin doing this, having that small group environment is very powerful. And then they really begin to sort of come, come to their own in terms of their ability to more clearly define their goal setting. So it's kind of interesting to see the progression in students as they go from um, working with perhaps me on a more individual basis, the small group environment within the classroom. And then through that experience, they actually uh, get quite quite good at sort of identifying their own goals in this particular case. They can also identify a category. I think uh, for organizational purposes, as we discussed earlier, it's really important for them to be able to sort of know where this goal fits within their particular life. So in this case, it might be um, work career. Uh, also timeliness. So when we talked about time management being a cognitive factor, this time management is certainly built into uh, the concept of a SMART goal. So what we've done is we've basically taken the SMART goal, specific, measurable, attainable, re relevant, and timely, and we've incorporated that into um, this particular environment. We also look at the active tasks. So as you can see here, these are individual tasks that are coming uh, due, and you can put due dates if you want. You can also identify 
the percentage complete. Um, now, all of these things are important, again, from a cognitive perspective, uh, because this will help individuals identify how many steps they've, they have um, written down. It also becomes a very good opportunity for the coach or for, in our case, the classroom. Uh, did you guys lose me? Yeah, your screen dropped, so I reshared it. Okay, let me share it again. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, so the tasks over here uh, are very good for uh, uh, the attention issue because if they write the task down, it's going to be right there. Um, it's also good for the memory issue. Um, the idea of a percent complete, we thought that might be important for them to be able to see right here on this main screen kind of where they're at within that process of that particular task. Uh, also, if you'll notice over here on the left-hand side of the screen, the idea of completed tasks is very important. And so in a lot of different kinds of apps, whether it's problem solving, decision making, uh, goal setting, et cetera, task management apps, often what happens is the individual tasks, once they're checked off, kind of go away. They go to a completed list and the user can no longer see them unless they think to go to that particular list or unless they go to the bottom of the screen. And so part of what we wanted to make sure is that individuals knew exactly what they had completed. Uh, this goes back to the motivation factor that we talked about in terms of um, issues that individuals have with problem solving uh, specifically, and then we sort of integrated it into goal setting. So if they can see how many tasks they've completed and not just a long list of all the things that they still have yet to do, that motivation factor becomes a, a pretty significant issue. Um, we also integrated uh, some self-regulation skills into the app, and as a result of that, we have what we call a weekly check-in. And so that weekly check-in, if you look over here on the left side of, uh, I guess you can look on the right side of the screen where it says review requirements. So this is basically what the person has done um, or completed over the course of that week. And we integrate this concept of a success journal and a challenges journal. Now this is extremely relevant for problem solving because part of what is going on as they're doing sort of this self-regulation process, evaluating um, what they have accomplished, what they haven't accomplished over the course of a week in this particular case. Um, there's a lot of problem solving that goes into that particular um, process. And again, using a coach or using a small group environment can be very helpful. So what I tend to do is I will have my students share what they have identified, what tasks they've completed, what tasks they may have not completed, they talk about why that might have happened. And then from there, that helps us identify some successes that they can write down um, in the success section and then some challenges in the challenges section. Um, one quote from someone who has used Reach My Goals, until I used Reach My Goals, I was so overwhelmed when setting goals that I had a difficult time separating one goal from another and never started or completed any of my goals. Again, Reach My Goals is for goal setting, but it is applicable, I think, to the concept of problem solving because many of the same issues are overlapping in this particular case. And uh, it's, it's common for a person with a brain injury to not know where to start with a problem or to not recognize that there is a problem. It's also common for um, the same person to, to struggle with goal setting. And so that's basically, um, Kind of why we added in a lot of these particular tools. When it comes to um, research on, on the Reach My Goals app, Reach My Goals is now part of a, an app called Best Suite, which is three different apps. Um, we have done some uh, preliminary research. This is just an example of a post-assessment checklist. So we have created some online trainings, which we had for ProSolve as well, uh, for the app part of ProSolve. And um, as a result of those online trainings, it takes about an hour to an hour and a half for an individual to go through the online trainings. I'm a big advocate of creating online trainings because what that allows an individual to do is to watch the videos or go through the practice exercises as many times as they need to go through them in order to really feel confident in their own skills in using the app. So this is just a quick example of a post-assessment checklist. So basically in the research that we've done, 
the individuals would go through the online training. Uh, we have a discussion area in the training, so if they have questions, they can ask questions and we can reply back to them. Uh, they then are given this particular assessment, which is a very practical assessment. Um, they have to go through each of these things, indicating that they have learned how to do um, each of the tasks and how to use the app specifically. Um, at Coastline, we have four uh, different groups. Um, in this particular case, we had three groups that we worked with, Tier 2, Tier 3, and Tier 4. And as you can see here, uh, Tier 4 is more of the mild um, injuries. And um, what, we, what we had here is uh, three of four people in Tier 4 got 100% on the post-assessment. And interestingly enough, the one person that did not do well um, did not do the training, just thought that he could go in and use the app without any kind of instruction whatsoever, still did 42% on the assessment without having any training, but it was the attention to detail and um, the, the lack of training that we believe was impacted in that particular individual. When we get to tier three, which is sort of a moderate impairment group, uh, we had one person who had a 94% 94 accuracy on the assessment, and then we had 36% and 42%. Uh, again, in both of these cases, the individuals did not do the training. Uh, the third group is more severely impaired individuals. We had one person that had 94%, even though that person was um, pretty significantly impaired, and that person went through 100% of the uh, training. The, 15, the person that had 15% did no training and um, definitely struggled. So what we kind of came out uh, with this particular research is that it works really well for individuals who have more mild impairment. Um, it, it is important for people to do training when learning to use not just this app, but in my belief, in, in any app that they're gonna be using on a daily basis that's going to help them from a cognitive perspective, the importance of training cannot be um, understated. And so the creation of training, whether it's paper pencil training, whether it's online training, is extremely important. Um, I know that there's a lot of times also where the training is sort of built into the apps themselves. And I think in some cases that can actually work okay. Uh, what we did in this particular study was we actually created the trainings and put them on a website so that the individuals could actually go to a website and see them and actually practice on their devices as they were doing the training. And I think that probably is the most effective um, version of training. So that, I believe, is the last slide of our um, slideshow. So, Melissa, if you want to take the screen back, um, I believe we're available for any phone calls now that, I'm sorry, any um, questions that people might have regarding right. um, what we've talked about. So, Lori, do you have anything else to add? Lori. Sorry, you're muted, I think. Sorry. Okay. There you are. <laughs> uh, uh, fortunately, Reach, Reach My Goals is uh, out there, available, and, and being very well used. And as Michelle said, we learned a lot developing ProSolve that kind of influenced the development of Reach My Goals. And, and then, it, you know, and then Michelle just, you've had a lot of app design experience. so. Um, and you might want to mention a little bit your other apps too uh, that you've been working on and that, that are part of the suite. But the reason why ProSolve isn't available uh, for dissemination is it just um, was not smooth enough as a, uh, in the end. It had enough glitchiness to it that we felt it just wasn't um, a good idea to go ahead and put it out there in the, in the form that it was in when we finished the project. So that was a judgment call, um, but the, I could, could do that, uh, make that decision, knowing that there were other very useful resources like Reach My Goals out there that would really accomplish uh, a lot of the same thing in terms of this overarching need to be very explicit about the process of problem solving. And, and I can't say underscore enough what Michelle just said about the training piece. Um, 
training on the specific steps, getting lots of practice and having that coaching uh, available, whether one-to-one -one or in a group setting. I can imagine for those of you working in high schools, mm -hmm. how this might be really useful. Uh, it, so it just, it just feels less, you know, uh, it's like, oh, I'm in this with my peers. We're all kind of sharing ideas, you know. Uh, I mean, Michelle, I'm, I'm guessing you have some wonderful stories to share about how, you, what kind, you know, just the energy around um, people getting together. Uh, so it just feels like I'm, I'm not the only one that messes up. You know, that is such a common experience for people. With Absolutely. Brain yeah, what adults. we do in my class is uh, every Thursday, we share so we do that weekly checklist every thursday each student goes through and shares sort of an update and um, it's amazing how much they get out of that process so if you're in a high school and you have a resource class or something the other thing that that i think is really important about whether it's problem solving or goal setting or decision making or whatever these are all skills that kids often struggle with regardless of brain injury so we know that individuals with brain injuries certainly struggle with this but um, these are all areas that a lot of people tend to struggle with and so by having some kind of systematic approach um, one thing that i'll add is it we're actually doing a research study right now with 50 veterans um, that are living with either TBI or PTSD um, or some kind of adjustment disorder. And we're teaching them to use Reach My Goals, uh, the best suite, which includes a couple of other apps. Um, and the training component is really one of the key things. So we've developed online training similar to what I talked about with Reach My Goals. And uh, the training piece has been very significant. So these are individuals that um, our veterans, you know, service members, they separated from the military. In most cases, they have PTSD, which is kind of interesting uh, as well. Sort of the cognitive piece of PTSD, I think, is sometimes not as readily recognized by individuals as more so the emotional component. But what we're finding with the research that we're doing is that, in fact, um, the cognitive component of PTSD is a significant component for many individuals. So that idea of um, having apps, having small groups, one of the things that we're doing in the study that I'm working on right now is we don't have small groups. We do have every two weeks we have a go to meeting session very similar to this where the participants can sign in. They can ask questions. I can share my screen. Um, help them solve problems that they might be having. And then also there's someone available that can answer via email or telephone, et cetera. So I think the coaching factor is key to all of this. I think the training factor is key to all this. Once an individual really learns and knows how to use the app and ultimately sees the benefit in the app, uh, at that point in time, those people are going to be using that app. That's what I found uh, in the individuals that I work with, whether it's the veterans project that I'm currently working on, my students at Coastline, or previous research projects. It's really the buy-in to what the strategy, the compensatory technique is that you're trying to get them to use. Once they buy into that and they see the benefits from that strategy, um, then they're really willing to, you know, to go full in on learning it and applying it and practicing it. So one side thing for the, the veterans project that I'm working in, which, which may be helpful in terms of research, we're still in the process of collecting data on this, but one of the things that we're doing with that project is they do the training, they get an assessment so that we know that they've learned how to use the app, but then every single week from the beginning of the project to the end of the project, they have to send us a weekly work sample. And what that does is that helps us identify that, in fact, they are using this technology in their everyday life. And I think that's a piece of the research component that sometimes we miss out on. And so uh, we're trying in our own little way to, you know, to bring that to the attention of individuals. And so I thought I might mention that um, just so that people are aware that that idea of having making sure that they're using the apps and seeing how they're using the apps um, is quite amazing. Michelle, there's a thank you so much. There's a question in the chat about how uh, is it possible for those interested to ac access the apps and there maybe you could give us a little bit of um, information on that. 
Sure. So um, one of the challenges I see that the person's asking about the Google Store and a Samsung device, uh, one of the challenges with development, app development, is Android, there are so many different versions of Android devices and so many different versions of Android, of the Android operating system currently available that designing for Android for a small nonprofit like mine is not realistic. So we did create Manage My Fatigue, which is available on Android. It's the original version of the app that I created about four years ago. Um, we've not been able to make a lot of updates to it just because of the issue with the, the operating system. So the apps that I've developed, the best suite that I mentioned is available, but it's only available on uh, the iOS system. And uh, unfortunately, as I've talked to different people who do app development, um, the Android app development just seems to be a challenge. And so that's something for you to think about and to consider. Another potential issue with Android, at least that I have had experience with in my own um, teaching experience, is because there's so many different versions of Android out there, it's not just difficult for developers, it's also difficult for users. So one quick example that Lori has heard before, but I teach a class after, um, after lunch sometimes, and I had two people with Androids in that class, and between the two of them, they had four devices. Each one had a phone and each one had a tablet. Each one of those devices had a different operating system and looked different. And so in that particular case, the two students were really quite wondering what was wrong with them because they couldn't get the, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with the, the two different devices. And the fact of the matter was, you know, one was a Samsung device and one was an LG and one had one um, primary screen on it and one had a different. And that can be very confusing. So my tendency is to recommend iOS devices uh, with the idea that they're very consistent from device to, to device and also from one generation of iOS to the next generation. There's usually very few major differences, which I know is a bone of contention for some individuals, but when you're working with individuals with cognitive issues, uh, that consistency is really super important. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just throw in um, another option that uh, is coming online, I think. Uh, but Michelle, you might have an update. Tracy Wallace out of the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia. She and her team uh, have developed, and, and I, I think it's soon to be ready commercially, uh, again, for iOS. I'm pretty sure that it's... I think it is. And it's called Swap My Mood. Um, and it, in the ProSolve manual that you were sent earlier today, that, uh, that app is mentioned in there along with Reach My Goals. It's two examples of technology that you can look at to support um, the overarching theme here of metacognition, goal setting, problem solving. And we like to think of them as two sides of the same coin. Um, and with Swap My Mood, they have really as the title suggests, they're looking at the mood piece of this equation with problem solving. I mentioned that earlier that, you know, one's emotions can swamp the ability to problem solve and, and it could thwart even the use of technology. So the ability to kind of identify triggers, the emotional triggers that can come with trying to tackle a problem are very important. So they're kind of taking that piece on as well as the, the steps to problem solving. So stay tuned for Swap My Mood. I wrote Tracy today yeah. to see if we could get an update and uh, I haven't heard from her yet, but uh, I'm sure it'll be out, if not already soon. So there you go. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be nice. Do we have any other questions? It looks like we don't. Um, so as I always end things, I, I would like to say, Please, if you have any questions that come up, email myself and I, uh, Melissa McCart here, um, and I will forward that to Lori and, and Michelle. That way we can put the answers to the questions up. Um, Lori and Michelle are both really responsive and will answer the questions fairly quickly. So, um, like how I can <laughs> <laughs> um, But no, we, we want to help and um, we 
we want to be able to get things in people's hands that they need. So if you have any questions, please don't ever hesitate to to shoot them our way. Um, and Agnes says, we got trained on Reach My Goals, and we love the app. Thank you, Michelle, for the training in Southern Oregon. Yes, Michelle, thank you. We heard great things. Hi, Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> Agnes is always on. Um, <laughs> On, on that note, everybody, I'm going to end the recording. So if you're somebody who has viewed this not live, um, the recorded version, and need a certificate, please feel free to email me. It's McCart, M-C-C-A-R-T, at uorgan.edu, and we will get you a, a certificate. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye. 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 Michelle and Laurie, thank you so very much. No, that was fun. Thanks for uh, including us. Of course. I'm sure I'll hit you up again. <laughs> <laughs> you guys did a great job. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. And, and, yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks again, Michelle. This you got off. Great, great to hear you. It's, I always learn something new, so appreciate it. All right. I'll see you Monday, Lori. Okay. Thanks again, Melissa. Take care. Bye-bye, you too. Bye. -bye,